Hello to everyone, and we warmly welcome you to the um, launch of the Wild DSI White Paper on Open Access Policy Options for Digital Sequence Information. And before we start the event, I would just like to give you a few technical clarifications about the online platform that we will be using. Um, as you can see, uh, as participants, your audio and your camera is switched off by default. And your form of communication with us would be uh, the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of your screen for questions. Please use this box for questions. Um, and any other form of communication or comment, please use the chat box, which you see also down at the bottom of your screen. Um, you have the options to post your questions anonymously, if you wish. And we would try our best to answer all your questions. And we look forward to a fruitful event. And I pass on the floor to the chair of our event today. That's Professor Rachel Weinberg. And she takes over now. Thank you. Thank you, Apneet. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. I'm Rachel Weinberg, and I'm based at the University of Cape Town, where I hold a bioeconomy research chair. And I'm also your chair for this event. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you to the webinar today and to the launch of a white paper that sets out various policy options for beginning to address the conundrum of the relationship between access and benefit sharing, or ABS, and digital sequence information, or DSI. So many of you will know that this is an issue that has stymied negotiations in multiple international fora, ranging from the Convention on Biodiversity through to the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and several others. And at the heart of the issue is the fact that international ABS policy has traditionally focused on the collection and exchange of physical material. So this approach was of course relevant when many of these agreements were first negotiated in the 1990s, but the situation today is very, very different. So over the past 30 years, the fields of synthetic biology and genomics have exploded alongside an exponential increase in the amount of genetic information that's being collected and stored. Um, you'll, many of you will know that much of this information is publicly available through open access or through open source databases and is critical for biodiversity research, for food security, for, pu for public health. So a very topical example, of course, is the importance of publicly available databases of pathogen information in the context of, of COVID-19 and the pandemic that we, we currently face. So at the same time, we know that the commercial value of biotech applications is significant. And the question that we need to ask, and which this webinar aims to address, is how can this value be leveraged to make research and commercialization more equitable? and to address some of the pressing issues that we face together today, especially with regard to biodiversity loss and the climate crisis. A major concern is that the benefit sharing should not tie up the scientific endeavor in the kinds of knots that we've seen emerge through ABS implementation in recent years. So in a recent Science Policy Forum article, which was co-authored with Sarah Ladd and others, we made a very strong call for the scientific community to engage actively in these policy discussions to find solutions. And this initiative is trying to do just that. And it's an enormously exciting endeavor. It aligns well with the new and inspired thinking that is going to be needed for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And we're really delighted to have such a large group, a large audience participating um, from all corners of the world. We also have a fabulous and prestigious group of presenters and panelists with us from the life sciences, from law, from economics. And we're looking forward to a dynamic and an engaged conversation with you all about the kinds of options that might be possible. So be before beginning our presentations, I want to run you briefly through the program. You should all have received a copy, but just to remind you of, of the different points in the program and the spaces that you'll have for engagement. So we'll begin with three inputs from Jörg Overman, from Amber Schultz and from Yvonne Kankyo, followed by a short session comprising questions for clarification, as well as a poll, which Upneet will administer and which you'll all be invited to participate in. And thereafter, each of the options described in the report will be presented by the authors, as well as an overview of proposed governance mechanisms. 
We'll then have another Q&A session and we'll be joined by um, Hugo Maria Scali from the European Commission and Melenia Garcia, who's the AVS focal point in Costa Rica for a lively panel discussion. And we'll again open up the floor for discussion and aim to close, I think just after 16.30 CET, given that we started a little bit late. So I hope that gives you a flavor for the event and also reassurance that there's going to be ample opportunity for your engagement, which we really, really would strongly encourage. That's the, the entire purpose of this webinar and platform. So without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Prof. Jörg Overmann, who's the director at the Leibniz Institute, DSMZ, the German Collection for Microorganisms and Cell Cultures, as well as a professor at the Braunschweig University of Technology. And I apologize for my mispronunciations. Over to you. Perfect, Rachel. Thank you very much. And uh, also on behalf of uh, the Leibniz Institute DSMZ, I also would like to welcome everybody very warmly. Um, and I want to uh, provide a few thoughts or give a few statements on why exactly it was that the Leibniz Institute uh, became involved in this endeavor and, uh, and what was driving us uh, in particularly uh, as scientists. So, um, as you probably know, the system in Germany is quite complicated. We have four different uh, non-university associations, and one of them is a Leibniz association, so similar to the Max Planck and Helmholtz, for instance. Uh, so we are scientists, um, and uh, we found that it is mandatory to consider the scientific facts in the upcoming discussions, and in, especially in finding solutions which would then effectively generate public and social benefits and really try to avoid some of the pitfalls, and Rachel has addressed uh, that also already a little bit. Um, and within the Leibniz Association, there is uh, one um, research alliance called Biodiversity, which um, is, I think, the largest ones, uh, encompassing 20 institutes uh, with three museums to plant collections and the microbial collection DSMZ. Uh, so we got together and uh, have been discussing all these issues quite um, often uh, and quite intensely. Um, and if I could get the next slide. Thank you. Um, the reason why we became so um, involved was that, especially the Leibniz Association and the research institutes uh, in uh, the Leibniz Associations um, are very often internationally highly active with their research, but also many of these institutes, particularly in the Research Alliance Biodiversity, are infrastructures which by mandate have to deal with uh, these issues of ABS uh, and the upcoming issue of DSI. Uh, just as an example, the DSMZ um, uh, sends out cultures of microorganisms uh, to almost 19 countries, 90, 90, um, uh, 10,000 different uh, recipients uh, per year, and it's about 40,000 items we send out. So it is, it is natural that, it, particularly in the Leibniz Association, we have to deal with these issues. And that made us, the DSMZ, that is, um, actually try to become Europe's first registered collection according to the EU Regulation 511. Um, and that has helped us to understand, of course, much better the um, issues and, and practically to, to see what might be possible pitfalls and what, what it needs to um, implement this. Um, as I said, uh, the Leibniz Association in particular uh, engages in multiple international research corporations, always with the aim in particular to um, uh, study biodiversity. However, I also have to say, and you see this as a short remark, we have seen over the past years severe and systematic setbacks in trying to implement and to follow the ABS. And this uh, actually, and Amber, I believe, will uh, give some more details on that. This has even led in some cases to a complete failure, for instance, of a program encompassing from the German side 10 million euros uh, which would have benefited the partner country tremendously, and the whole program crashed uh, within a year, more or less. And um, this shows that we are dealing with 
substantial problems, as was said before by, by Rachel, in, in really implementing and really finding the solutions. Now, the most important point here, by the, why we got involved in the DSI issue, is that for DSI, there are additional challenges as individual data are not equal to scientific knowledge. Um, the system we have so far um, is so far the, the system which enables us to generate the knowledge which is, not, uh, which is essential, mostly because we need to compare um, sequence information sub, um, on a large scale and not on a bilateral scale. And it offers a global cooperation we, we really would like to engage in with our partners in, in other countries. Um, as you will see later in more detail, uh, just sequence information is used by 8 million uh, scientists outside of those countries where the databases are hosted and they use the system for free. And, uh, and a detailed analysis as part of a CBD study, you see the link there. Um, uh, a large part of that does not, as sometimes assumed, actually originate from the typical provider countries, as in the case of the Nagoya Protocol. So there is a very specific situation. There are huge challenges. And we asked ourselves the question, could there be options which go beyond the current ABS model, which are more um, appropriate to reach what we want to reach, namely um, uh, an equal scientific exchange, joint exchange and joint um, uh, scientific cooperation with respect to biodiversity and a, a functioning um, ABS regime. And this made us, uh, or made uh, a colleague of mine and me, two of the institutes, you see that it's not only the DSMZ, but also the IPK in Gattersleben, go to the German Ministry of Education and Research and um, try to argue that we need a project, and that is the Wild DSA project, um, to have the opportunity together with colleagues worldwide actually, um, to search for solutions, so search for solutions out of the angle um, of science to make sure exactly what Rachel uh, mentioned before, um, that we consider these facts we have been experiencing and which we, which we found have been very difficult um, in, in previous years uh, to, to come to a solution which really benefits everybody as we want. Um, I just want to make this point, this, this project is really funded by the German ministry and we are really glad for the ministry to follow our suggestion and, and enable this one and a half year study. And we really hope uh, that this will contribute to the discussion and, and add what I think are very important scientific facts uh, which we need to consider to come to a workable solution. Thank you very much. And now, uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Amber Scholz. Um, uh, she is uh, the deputy to the scientific director of the DSMZ, that is to me, and she um, luckily agreed to lead this project together with our colleagues from the IPK. And she will now give an introduction more in detail to this wild DSI project we are so happy uh, to be able to conduct. So, Amber. Thank you, Jörg. Appreciate it. Um, before I take over the floor, I would love to give my co-lead, Jens Freitag, the option to say a few words. Unfortunately, Jens couldn't be here today at another professional commitment at the Institute. Um, but if Zyra, we could get his short little one minute video and his welcome remarks to us all. Dear colleagues and friends, Due to other professional commitments, I can only participate at this event as a recording. I regret this and at the same time, I am glad about the technical option to become part of it today. Of course, I wish you that it will be a successful, a interesting and despite all restrictions, a highly communicative as well as creative event. Creativity and networking will be the important criteria today and will remain so in the coming months when it comes to further discussions and further development of the document launched today. 
This personal commitment from all of you is important and highly needed. I also hope that you will motivate other colleagues to do so the same. I also want to thank the whole team of the BMBF funded Wild DSI project, the team that was engaged in the preparation of the document to become released today. Connected with the project is the hope to give scientists a voice, a voice in a very important and highly aggregated political process. Therefore, I wish you an interesting, successful, as well as creative meeting today, and of course, fruitful corporations in future. Thank you very much. So unfortunately, we'll, that was all we can get from Jens today, although he'll give another presentation to the options later on. Um, so we'll have a bit of unequal leadership today, but it was a pleasure to, to do this project with Jens. So what I'm gonna walk you through is first, uh, just a short bit of background on the project. You've heard a lot, both from Rachel and from York. And then I'd like to walk you through our wish list, if you will, the requirements that we believe are important for successful science. Um, before we can even start to talk about any options for DSI. So the first on the background, the wild DSI project itself. There's three things you need to know about the project. Number one, we made sure, and it was very important to us that it's interdisciplinary. Um, Rachel mentioned this briefly. So we have both a number of biologists that have been involved, experts from databases, from law in three different forms, at least environmental law, intellectual property and international law. Um, experts from innovative finance and from development policy. We also had a focus on making sure that we got a broad swath of scientific stakeholders. And over the course of three different workshops, we had over 180 workshop participants and interviewed 37 different uh, scientists that are active in middle income countries. Our guiding principle, the thing that I said over and over and over again throughout the project is people, we need to think about the fact our guiding light is open access and the question is, is there any way we can do benefit sharing better than it's being done now? And those were the two signposts that we used, whatever we talked about, whatever we considered. I'd also like to challenge you in case you're sitting there at your desk at home thinking, okay, five requirements for successful science. Yeah, but why is successful science so important for me? I'm not a scientist, I don't care. Well, I'm giving you here about a dozen or more real life examples that we heard from our scientific stakeholder workshops. So you can see a variety of different disciplines from the life sciences, maybe you know, yeah, DSI is used for biodiversity, but that's a pretty big topic, right? So here's a couple of specific examples from wildlife conservation, trying to reduce the amount of waste from pig feed or that ends up in our, in our rivers and our lakes. Identifying poaching, um, trying to understand climate change adaptation and ecosystem resilience antimicrobial resistance, what do you do when, when, when antibiotics don't work anymore? Trying to understand pollinator loss and insect taxonomy, nutrient cycling. So you can see DSI matters to us all and this, these public good, these types of scientific topics, I think we wanna keep going. We wanna make sure that they're able. And so this is why we have to ask ourselves first, we wanna have these examples, these types of successful science preserved well, then we need to make sure that these five requirements are as, as addressed as best as possible. The other thing I'd like to remind you of, and I hope that you already know that, is that not all DSI is under the CBD. So you can see here six different circles layered on top of a, um, an image actually of tangled DNA, the way that the DNA molecule itself folds in on itself in, inside the nucleus. And this is actually sort of a metaphor for how the different sequences of DNA exist in the databases. Now, of course, they're not tangled up together in the literal sense. In fact, they're very well structured, but they're tangled in the data use sense. So they're sourced from genetic resources. They're sourced from, gen from biological material in each of these different legal jurisdictions but yet they sit in one very, very large data bucket of 1.5 billion sequences. And when the user uses them, they use them very much all at once in this core infrastructure. And so as scientists, we don't really realize that there's these six overlapping circles that are sitting there, or maybe more someday, but rather we use everything. 
So the first requirement, open access. You might be sitting there saying, why is this open access so important to these crazy scientists? Well, why do we put these things in the public database? There's four main reasons to remember. Number one, we want to publish. That's how we communicate with the world and with each other. And our journals will not publish our scientific papers unless the data that we base those articles on is available open access. Our funding agencies, both here in Europe and across the world, often requirements. So I have to sign a grant agreement with that funding agency that says my research results will be available to the scientific community in open access databases. Number three, it's also part of our ethical um, requirements that we place on ourselves in order to enable reproducibility, that I can repeat the work that people did before me, a sense of integrity to avoid fraud, and also a data security mechanism to make sure that if my computer crashes here, I still have a backup in the core database. And fourth, it's a really important biological observation. If you read these letters, ACGT, ACGT, they mean nothing to you. How do you figure out what those letters mean? You compare them to the things that we already know them about. And the more comprehensive, the more integrated that data set is, the better that I can understand these letters in a row. Number two, simplicity. This is a really important requirement for understanding and thinking about DSI options. We have to learn from the Nagoya Protocol and realize, as York suggested, where and how DSI is different than accessing a physical genetic resource. So here's a, a cartoon schematic of how a normal Nagoya Protocol access situation would work. Probably many of you are more expert at this than I am, but I would remind you that even all of these arrows and boxes are already simplified. There are countries that have even more checkpoints, have multiple industries, um, ministries, or multiple documentation requirements throughout. It's a complex system. And why doesn't that fit here? Or what's the problem here? Well, the problem is, as we know as scientists, as, as York alluded to, that when we're accessing physical genetic resources, since 2014, we've interviewed 32 different institutes here in, in Germany, and we've realized that on average, there's about a one year delay in order to get that permit to access that. Now, this sort of kind of works because not everybody goes out into the field to access these things. They're sort of specialized field projects. But what about if you're using this for DNA? DNA sequences? What about if you use this system to access the database? Well, as I've mentioned, there's 1.5 1, 1 billion sequences in the database. Ah, I just lost my slide. There we go. Technical glitch. Um, this is, I'm, I'm missing some uh, animation here. Oh, well. Um, I'd, I'd like to sort of address this in the context of this myth of going out into the world, going fishing for that one piece of very special DSI and actually explain how scientists use the database. So in a physical genetic resource situation, you would have a scientist, they would go out into the jungle and they would sample what they wanted and then they would take it back. So they're dealing with, with objects or several objects. In the databases, we don't go into the database and take one single sequence out of the database and say, okay, this is the thing, this is the place I wanna start my research. Instead, when we have a brand new string of letters, what we do, we go and we blast it. That's always the first thing you do in biological science. You blast it and you try and figure out where this new unknown thing is relative to the other things. And this slide that's unfortunately a bit covered up there in the back, you might have a similarity diagram where I've compared my new sequence to the 1.5 billion other sequences in the database and I've gotten the answer. These are the things that are similar to them in these regions. Then I want to take this little tiny piece of pink on the left and I want to zoom in and I look at it in an alignment file. And then I look in there and I'm really interested in that blue column in the middle and I zoom in and I compare several hundred sequences to understand this biological function. In other words, I don't go fishing for the single magical special sequence, but I am constantly iteratively looking at billions, then thousands, then hundreds of sequences and integrating that information all of the time repetitively. That's how we use DSI. And that's why pick and mat simply don't match this situation. Number three, a DSI system, a DSI option has to be future-proofed. So unfortunately, I apologize, uh, the, the animation here that I would have shown you but on the very back of this is a, a diagram that you can actually find in the CBD study on databases and traceability. That's the link from York's slide. It's also available on the CBD website, but it's a cartoon diagram of the DSI ecosystem where you see all of these blue arrows that you can see 
are automated interfaces between different technical infrastructures where the data is constantly exchanged and interpreted in different ways in different formats. And if you see all of these wires back here, this is just to sort of give you the metaphor that this system is working very well. It's been built up over 40 years and it's highly complex. In addition, the data set doubles in size every 18 months. So it's a massively growing system, highly complex and integrated. And we would ask policymakers to please never touch a running system. This is working, let's work with this system. And if we need to do benefit sharing, we do it on top of this. But we don't try to break this very well architected system. Number four, legal certainty. There's three things that legal certainty mean, that a system should be clear, it should be transparent and predictable. And I thought this, this metaphor here that you see on the right is sort of elegant. So if you imagine that the DSI scientific system, the scientific data system is at the very top of the water column where there's lots of light shining through and it's very transparent, it's very easy to see what's out there. The legal certainty that we have right now is way down at the bottom of the abyss in the midnight zone of the water column where light doesn't really shine through. It's impossible for me right now to know if the DSI that I'm using came from or has um, access uh, permits associated with it from perhaps one of these 15 countries that already regulate DSI or any future individual national legislation that might regulate DSI. And so if we think about a universal or a global mechanism for DSI, we would say that we need to work on getting this arrow to go upward. We need to bring the DSI legal certainty out of the abyss and connect it better with the scientific data system that already exists and that already is highly transparent. Again, an animation problem. I love animation. Um, so um, the fifth requirement, and this is actually less of a requirement and really an important suggestion, just that you keep the biological reality in mind when you think about making new DSI systems, new access and benefit sharing for DSI. And that is in order to sequence stuff, in order to get all of these A's, C's, G's, and T's that you see here, you have to always access the genetic resource first which means that scientists like me that work in this institute and millions of others around the world, we're gonna have a two tier system, right? So we'd have to go through a system for the genetic resource and then a system for this. So wouldn't it be clever if a new DSI framework also created perhaps an optional, but at least a mechanism that made it possible for some countries if they wanted to, to create a simpler system to allow um, DSI producing genetic resources to be brought under a larger DSI framework. There were a few other things that didn't make it to our top five list, but that we also thought we'd put out there into the world. Um, additional considerations um, for assessing DSI options, sort of less from the scientific perspective and more perhaps from legal or other um, disciplines. Number one, the economic perspective. Think about the time it takes until benefits materialize. Look at the options and ask yourself, how long would it be until there was actually a bank transfer of money? And think about the options in terms of, okay, if it's a really complex, long system, it might take a long time until benefits sh show up. Number two, can ABS and biodiversity be better connected? Right now, they barely influence each other, but we think they could be better connected. And number three, and perhaps most important to me personally, I think that there is room to look at this tangled DNA, DNA space and think about a universal solution. Instead of having all these separate legal jurisdictions, Think like a scientist and realize that we use it all mixed up together. It's all tangled already for us. And so why not think about one mechanism for everything? And with those requirements laid out in advance, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague in Spain, Professor Ivan Cancio. Ivan, the stage is yours now. Thanks a lot, Amber. So DSI and the Nagoya Protocol, in, sus in some aspects, have problems to fit. DSI is the outcome of the utilization of, utilization of genetic resources. And under the Nagoya protocol, its use can conceptually be addressed through mutually agreed terms and their bilateral negotiations. But there are significant technical and practical challenges for, a, for such a scenario, which are quite relevant for scientists. So, if in DSI and genetic resources are accessed and used at different scales and complexity. In our paper, we highlight five factors that demonstrate the DSA scale 
problems that need to be considered in the ABS context. First, this is the issue of sequence and data volume. Then we have the amount of data that is moved. We also have the way in which databases are arranged and constructed. Then we need to consider the way in which we scientists publish. And last, we cannot forget that nature repeats itself also at the sequence level. So as to data volume, sequencing is becoming cheaper and cheaper. And it could be said that it's now a semi-democratic laboratory procedure, a standard in biosciences research across disciplines. Multiple genomes have been fully sequenced in the last 20 years, and partial information is available for virtually any known organism. And the consequence is that the public database in the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration stores 8.8 trillion nucleotide bases, more than 1.4 billion sequences from all kinds of living organisms that are doubling every 18 months. For a comparative or in contrast, and I know that the comparison may be not fair as countries are slowly coming to the ABS practice, there are not even 2,000 internationally recognized certificates of compliance in the ABS greenhouse, most of them coming from one single country. If you want bring, to bring this to a scale, the diameter of planet Earth plus its atmosphere, it's more or less 1.4 billion centimeters. The diameter of the central circle in the standard football ground, it's 1,900 centimeters. So you can make the comparison of a scale there. DSA data is so useful and scientifically so relevant and is so accessible in the INSDC databases that it receives more than 10 billion data requests per year from 15 million users in every country in the world. Such requests can be manual with one person at the other side of the computer, but in many circumstances, interaction with the databases is automated. In this way, the ENSDC sequence data set is downloaded over 34 million times per year. The figure that I'm showing you here is a frozen image that I captured on Sunday of a real-time life map showing the interactions of users with the European nucleotide archive. Scientists from virtually all countries access DSA databases, and they work also on Sundays, day and night. Users in every country and automated data requests are possibly incompatible with a bilateral mechanism to enforce benefit sharing. Database landscape. ENSDC with its three repositories interconnects thousands of other databases and DSI analysis tools. DSI users have many things in common, but they represent different communities of practice and sub-branches of biosciences knowledge and they need their specific data treatment processes. This free walk in the sky, often automatic, from database to database, from database to tool and back, that it's so prized by scientists, depends on compatibility and absence of data friction. Changes to the core infrastructure via registration, logins, tracking systems will create significant difficulties to data movement. Now think of me, a poor scientist. I am as good as my rate and quality of publications. To publish, we are required to make DSI available under open access conditions with unique sequence identifiers. An, an analysis of peer-reviewed publications in PubMed found that on average, 44 sequences are mentioned per publication. Moreover, 
we are gregarious and work and publish through transboundary collaborations. So any DSI system must consider this complexity, multiple countries of origin, multiple authors from different countries, and different contributions of DSI to the end results. The Will See project, by the way, is in the process of finalizing an interactive website on DSI use, reuse, and international collaboration in, in publications. And last but not least, Darwin watches us. Evolution is, as a theory is perfect. We have the view inherited from Darwin's gigantic thinking that the species are the perfect adapted end product of natural selection. This is of course, this of course is connected to the concept of hot spots of biodiversity based on species counts. But mechanistically, we know that evolution is like bricolage. It takes whatever it is at hand. The species counts do not reflect the evolutionary concept of genetic conservation and interconnection. Genetic similarity is maintained while all gene innovations arise, arise from previously existing nucleotide sequences. There is so much genetic repetition in nature that it is very difficult at the sequence level to determine who deserves credit for a particular stretch of DNA sequence, as Amber has said before. Just one example of gene sequence interconnection, and I finish. When the, genome, when the human genome was sequenced, it was believed to contain 100,000 protein coding genes, but it contains around 20,000. Final annotation of human genome was done through comparison with that of the pufferfish that was sequenced by the research group that had sequenced the genome of a nematode, C. elegans, which was annotated through comparison with the genomes, genomes of two C. skirts, two drosophila, and four yeast genomes. We humans possess a very humanly called gene Peter Pan, and there are homolog genes throughout all the animal kingdom and all the way down to yeast. And with this, I hand out, I hand out back to Abneet. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ebon. Thank you, Amber and Jörg. Um, uh, I would request you, Jörg and Amber, to switch on their cameras too. Um, and before we start the clarifying question and answer round, um, I would, uh, we would actually like to have your input as the audience um, on a poll, um, which we would like to know which, uh, which scientific requirement is most important to you. We will begin the poll right now and it will take a minute. Um, and uh, we would um, be very interested to hear um, to get your insight. And I pass on the floor to Rachel during this time um, for some questions for uh, the speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Apneet, and thanks to the three um, speakers for very clear and interesting presentations. Um, so while the poll is running, there are a few questions that popped up in the Q&A box. We're taking questions at the moment of clarification. I think the more substantive questions we'll, we'll pick up later on in the, in the discussion. But for now, it's really just a question of clarification. Um, I think there's a, there, there are two questions here relating to the process, the research process and who was involved. And it would be good mm -hmm. to hear from Amber or others in the team. Um, the one question was about how indigenous knowledge holders and scientists, indigenous scientists I'm imagining, were involved in the process and linked to that, how were the southern countries, or how were countries of the global south represented in the stakeholder um, consultations or research process through this uh, project? Yeah, so uh, maybe I can... One first. Yeah, maybe I can take a, a hack uh, at that first, Rachel. Um, so these are really important questions and we really worked at this. I mean, so first of all, of course, this is a, a 
German funded project um, and not an extraordinarily generous one that we could fly in everyone uh, to Berlin and to Bonn where we held the workshops, right? So we, we were lucky to get um, pretty broad representation across a lot of Western, Central and Eastern Europe um, at the stakeholder workshops. But what we did to actually try to fill in the gaps is we conducted interviews. Um, so we had three different um, individuals in the team collect uh, 37 different interviews lasting on each about an, an hour on average um, from four main countries. So we focused on Colombia as the host to the Open Ended Working Group 3, from South Africa, who is one of the co-hosts of the Norway-South Africa GSI Dialogue, from India, which is also in um, Opnit's home country, um, and also from uh, Brazil, um, where we happen to ha also have a lot of uh, contacts and where I was also in December. There's a couple of people on the webinar there as well. Um, and so through those uh, interviews, we were able to, to bring in an additional input. And when you get a chance to look in depth at the paper, you'll also see a paragraph in the paper that really highlights, um, and not surprising to us, but maybe to you, how, how similar uh, scientists around the world use the databases. And the take home message that the open access system is extraordinarily important to them um, because it's open, it's free, it doesn't require registration, it is simply there for them to use, as Yvonne said, at any time of the day or night. Um, it's also important that interestingly, also as Jörg alluded to, a number of colleagues in the South that have experienced themselves with the Nagoya Protocol expressed um, some delays in research that they've experienced in those countries, working either in broader collaborations or in cooperations, um, but also recognize and said there is a need for benefit sharing. And so this is sort of this tension um, in the spectrum that we tried to incorporate. The question on indigenous people is a little bit harder for us as scientists sitting in, in Northern Germany to access. This is something we did try to talk with participants, uh, with interviewees about and to consider, but this admittedly is not something that we could spend a lot of time on in this project. It's a, a much more of a, a technical focus, if you will. Thanks, Amber. Um, yeah, uh, thanks, Amber. And sorry, Rachel, to interrupt. So um, we stopped the poll right now. Um, so um, the results of the poll should be coming up um, on your screen. And um, Rachel, I pass it back on to you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Apneet. I think what would also be useful to, to correlate these results is to the audience. Uh, you know, what's the representation of the audience in terms of scientists versus industry versus NGOs and so on? So perhaps that information could be provided after the event. I think it would be very interesting. Um, there are a number of comments, a very, very active uh, discussion, I think, rather than questions that are emerging in the Q&A box. Um, uh, and this really is a session for clarity rather than getting into the meat of the discussion. Um, but perhaps uh, the, the panelists who come in could read some of these comments and incorporate some of the responses um, in their presentations. I'd like to just touch on two, which are, I think, quite quick. The one is a question about open access for researchers. Is this defined as only for academic researchers or is it also for industry researchers? And I think that's a really important point because um, the industry databases, from what I understand, are quite different to those which you're referring to. So could somebody respond to that, please? Open access for researchers, is this defined as only for academic researchers or is this also for industry researchers? How, how are you defining open access? Yo, here, Yvonne, I'm, I can also answer, but I... Yeah, I mean, science is the, science is science. And it's science in academia, that is where I am by, based, or it's science in industry. And open access is both important for academics and for, uh, for, um, and for the industry. So for me, the, 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 the limits are very blurred. Yeah, may, maybe also a point to that. And this reminds me of um, the, the many discussions we have with respect to our uh, cultures, which we send out. And according to our terms and conditions, which you can find on our website, you will find that commercial uh, use is not granted with, with the resources we provide for, for various reasons, also because we 
became a registered collection. What I'm, I, what I'm trying to say here is um, research in a commercial enterprise is not necessarily and quite often not commercial use and the other way around. So I think we have to be very clear what, and I think this is the aim of the question here, um, uh, how we define this with respect to the type of use which, which uses the open access. Uh, as of today, obviously the open database, uh, the SCC databases are open full stop. Um, but I think the, the question aims at, uh, um, at, the, at the future point, um, do we want to um, have, have it completely open or how do we deal with the issue that an open resource might be used for commercial purposes? And, and that needs to be discussed. What I can say in this respect is we, I think, have managed very well to split this up. Um, so I think it is in principle possible um, it, it will not be a solution to close everything up and, and then individually grant access based on, an, uh, on a check of possible commercial use or not. Um, so um, I think that was a, what, what the question actually aimed at. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jörg. One more, I think, very quick. Um, response from, from Yvonne, please. Uh, there's a question that you said it's not possible to link DSI to individual genetic resources. In actuality, it's possible to link genetic sequences to individual organisms as a whole, especially when looking at SNPs. But once the genetic data is in a database, it is difficult to link it to single organisms due to homologies. So I wonder, Yvonne, if you just want to briefly respond to that point. Yeah, yeah I agree that. Uh, there are sequences that you can you can trace back to individual individual species. I mean, all of the phylogeny in the last years is based on comparison of sequences for phyl phylogenetic uh, analysis. That is true, but in many circumstances, all the all the sequences are interconnected among them. There is one question in the in the panel of uh, of questions that says collagens. All the animals are producing collagen. So if you are using collagen, which is the sequence difference between the collagen that I produce myself into my bone in comparison with the collagen that the muscle produces in its cell? The sequence difference is minimal. So which is the, which is the, the value of the part of the sequence that you can find in the muscle in comparison with the part of the sequence that you can find in humans? So that's the main issue. And if I can just use your imagination, right? So how many collagen genes are there in the database? There is several thousand, tens of thousands. And imagine that you're a researcher and you're interested in producing some beauty cream and you take from along that whole length of gene, let's say it's 5,000 letters long. You take the most common letter in every position to make a brand new synthetic gene. Well, if you use 10,000 sequences, then how do you determine which country from that newly invented string of, of letters gets credit for which letter in that string? That's the problem. Can you identify the origin of an individual sequence? Yes, you can. How do you identify its contribution to some research outcome, be it commercial or non-commercial? And the answer there is that it's, it's so impossible because of how we actually use sequence data. Thank you, Amber. I'm afraid we're going to have to move on. Um, if you look at the Q&A box, you'll see that there is a very, very rich uh, discussion going on. I would urge panelists in particular, um, speakers, to respond to as much of this as possible um, you know, through typing answers. The rest we can pick up as much as possible later on. But let's move on now to, um, to the, the panel which is going to talk to the different policy options that are presented in the report. And the first speaker, I think, is Guy Kochman. Over to you, Guy. Thanks, Rachel. So option zero is the status quo. This is the uh, current situation uh, that we have at the moment. I'm just waiting for the slide to advance. So in this, in this option zero, uh, 
DSI are produced in, in lots of different places and they are uh, made available through public sequence databases. So that is a process of organizing the data and structuring the data into a holistic corpus uh, that is, is accessible and useful. The access is open, uh, it's freely available to everybody, and many people indeed access the system and they derive benefit from that system. And that benefit is very typically made available uh, as data and services and knowledge uh, to all. Uh, and that is a key global resource uh, that, that is produced already from the system. So the data services and knowledge are uh, important in many different domains. Uh, for our purposes here, they're very important in biodiversity conservation, but of course they're also important in food security, the fight against infectious disease, uh, tracking and dealing with invasive species and many, many others. So the public sequence databases already exist and have done so for the last 40 years. Uh, they are committed to open and registration free access for all comers. Anyone can access the data. They provide a whole host of tools, technologies and services, and they provide support for users of those, uh, of all of those. They're globally comprehensive. They, they, they span all species uh, that are sequenced, um, all scientific domains and all scientific applications, all scientific questions. Uh, they form the permanent database of record. Um, but they also play an important role as the forum in which the scientific process takes place. So the contention and the conflicts and the discussion plays itself out uh, alongside the evidence that's presented in INSDC databases. They're strongly connected to the scientific literature, so they're very much embedded in the publication process, which means that when one reads the scientific literature, one can link across to the data. And although everything is provided openly uh, and for free, um, it is a, a, a significant annual investment by the various institutions and the, the, the countries that support the, the, the INSDC database in, it, databases in, in, in um, maintaining this system. So what is it then about this open access and this, this maximum benefit that can be derived? Well, as soon as the sequence goes into the, into the public databases, it becomes available in the context of everything else and many people access. And these may be people who are uh, curating, people who are uh, asking questions, analyzing data, um, bringing data together and interpreting, uh, or people building databases and people writing scientific publications. And, and the, uh, the publications, um, publications are made available for people to, uh, to use onwards with all of these other benefits. So just to take the example of one set of users who pull the data from the public databases and build uh, further databases, and these typically take some uh, particular slice of data from the system and add uh, enormous value through curation or, or interpretation. And so these are specialist databases. Uh, and, and if we, uh, in a recent survey, you can see there are 800 or so uh, sequence databases that, um, uh, that are important and openly available, that are doing something specialist with the data, providing some particular specialist scientific um, uh, service to users made openly available. Um, and the vast majority, but almost exclusively, these databases are connected directly, they're pulling data directly from, from INSDC, from the public databases. So this is just one example of how these benefits can flow very broadly. And so we're talking about a non-monetary form of benefits. Um, and we can begin to look at how uh, the non-monetary benefits flow around the world. And so we have two world maps here. In the top map, we're looking at the countries of origin of uh, DSI. And this is the country in which the species or the sample was taken. So it's the true origin of the organism that gave up the sequence, regardless of where the sequencing actually happened. Um, and so what we see is that actually the, uh, the, the, the majority of the, of the DSI does not come from low and middle income countries, it tends to come from uh, higher income countries. We look at the lower map, uh, we're looking at the countries that consume DSI from the public system. Um, and here we see a different thing, we see a, a much more even, a much more flatter distribution. Every country accesses this public system. Um, and, and actually things are much more even. Uh, and so if you consider these two together, then the direction of flow of this non-monetary benefit is um, perhaps, as, 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 as might not be expected, is actually uh, not uniformly from the low and middle income countries to the, to the high income countries, but perhaps the other way around. So before I hand on uh, to uh, talk to, to the speakers around the other options, 
Um, each of these options, so I've been talking about non-monetary benefits, the following options will cover um, different aspects of adding in monetary benefits on top of the system that I've described. Um, I should point out that the options that are presented do not necessarily represent the views of the people that will be presenting them. And with that, I hand over to uh, Professor Esther van Dillen uh, from the University of Antwerp. Thank you, Guy. So I'm presenting today uh, the first policy option. Um, which is the micro levy system. And in comparison to um, some of the other options that will be presented to you today, this is a relatively simple and elegant solution. Um, so the micro levy system uh, consists of small charges on high volume purchases of products and services. And these could be different products or services. And they're imposed in practice by individual countries feeding then into a multilateral fund. And a good example of such a micro levy system that is working, that is operational, is the airline ticket levy. So this is um, a micro levy that was uh, established by France in 2006, and a system that was also later adopted by other countries, uh, such as Brazil, UK, Congo, Madagascar, and Mali. And so in this case, the funds are directed at unit aid, which is a medicine purchasing facility. And so between 2006 and 2018, uh, almost $2 billion were collected. And this was about 62% of the total revenue of unit aid. So this is a considerable uh, amount of money that was generated through this micro levy uh, system. And so what we propose for DSI as a way to um, comply with excess and benefit sharing obligations um, is um, a, a micro levy that is linked to aspects of DSI generation, such as for instance, DSI sequencing services, synthesis services, uh, laboratory reagents or equipment. And so, so what are the specific characteristics then of this micro levy system? So these are relatively small amounts of money paid by individual uh, users, consumers of those products and services but would lead to potentially big gain due to the high volume of the purchases of such uh, services and products. And in addition, it would not change the open access conditions for DSI because there are no new obligations that are being created upon uploading or downloading or access. So the income generation also happens relatively early in the R&D process. So you don't have to wait for commercialization. It actually happens quite early in the R&D process and users pay upfront when they are using uh, or when they're buying uh, particular uh, products and services. And so there is no need for tracking and tracing of the compliance, which is an issue in some of the other policy options that are being presented. And you would have immediate legal certainty upon the receipt of the products and the services. So you have, would have a, uh, a proof of payment and hands also compliance uh, with access and benefit sharing obligations. So what is also uh, interesting in this model is that everybody who's using those products and services is, is actually paying. So there's no distinction between private and public, public actors. So the discussion that, uh, that we had before on what is commercial use, what is not commercial use, when is this really uh, applicable is, is not so relevant within this policy option. And so it's quite good in terms of uh, shared social responsibility. Basically, it could also be used both for DSI and genetic resources. So there's um, a, a link possible there. It could be linked to a pre-existing fund or it could be a self-standing mechanism. Uh, so you have quite some flexibility in that respect. And then ultimately, the money in the fund uh, would of course go to biodiversity conversation and sustainable use. And it could, for instance, be used for capacity development uh, for uh, bioinformatics in uh, the uh, countries concerned. So um, if we then move uh, to the next slide with some of the advantages and disadvantages, and I will start with the disadvantages. So it is um, not easy to really select the most appropriate product and service for the micro levy, but we already make a proposal and try to make it as concrete as possible by linking it to DSI sequencing services or laboratory agents um, or um, other types of equipment uh, linked to DSI. 
as it is an, uh, an, an option that is applied at the national level, so we need uh, national legislation in order to operationalize it, there is a risk that some countries would not take up the suggestion, for instance, by the CBD to have such a system. And so there might be a risk of jurisdiction shopping. There may also be some pressures from the domestic level against diverting the money to foreign beneficiaries. Um, so that's uh, something where we would need to think of governance solutions to, to prevent that. And of course, every policy option is not immune to economic shocks. So that, that's a challenge uh, probably in general for many of the models. Then in terms of the, um, the, the advantages, so as I already said in the beginning, this option is relatively easy to implement, especially if you compare it to some of the, the later options. It involves a limited financial burden for individual users and consumers. Um, the administrative cost of the model should be relatively low, uh, while at the same time also uh, safeguarding a stable and predictable source of revenue, as long as you have a good basis for your products and services on which the micro levy is, is charged. Overall, the module, uh, the, the, the option, the policy option is relatively flexible as you could link it both to DSI and genetic resources and also in other ways, it's, it's relatively flexible. Um, so those are the disadvantages uh, and advantages. And so now without further ado, I pass on the floor to Jens Freitag, uh, who will uh, say a little bit more about the membership fees. And due to other professional commitments, I have to apologize and tell you that this statement here is recorded. But nevertheless, I'm very happy that I can introduce to you the option number two, the membership fee. The premise of this membership fee model is very simple. The entire global data set of digital sequence information represents a value in its completeness and only in its wholeness it is relevant for researchers around the world. The advantage is therefore that the sequence information is not only preserved as a whole, but also remains accessible. Here we call it open access. Links to other databases are also easy to make, and we have to keep in mind there are almost 2,000 other databases in the world at present which have direct links to INSDC. When accessing the DSI dataset, the user is notified by the system and must acknowledge her or his obligations for benefit sharing at an access point. Thereafter, the user, who may also be a legal entity, has to pay a membership fee. The membership fee will be paid towards a separate entity. Here we refer to it as a public-private partnership. In the membership fee model, a user becomes a member of the multilateral mechanisms by paying an annual membership fee. For the duration of membership, the user has access and use rights to all DSI without further restriction. This also provides legal certainty, both in terms of access and use of information. By termination of a user membership, the user would be responsible for assessing the benefit sharing obligations on a bilateral basis or need to discontinuing the use of DSI. Only users whose turnover income is above a negotiated threshold would have to pay the membership fee. Users below the threshold would not pay any fee. Thus the vast majority of academic users who have no significant income or turnover as well as small startups would be excluded from the obligation of a monetary benefit sharing. So what are the disadvantages of such a model? It requires users who previously had free access to provide a reimbursement in the form of a financial resource. It would therefore be a change from a procedure we are used to. The mechanisms for guaranteeing compliance is relatively weak. And it's very likely that negotiating the threshold for the calculation of a membership fee will be difficult. On the other hand, we have several pros, several advantages of such a model. 
The membership fee is easy to understand and does not require the development of new technologies or infrastructure. Therefore, it saves time, money in the implementing of the system. It is a multilateral system with international agreed conditions. This would reduce the administrative burden for both providers and users. The important principle of open access would not be affected. And the model offers the possibility to become a universal digital sequence information solution, which might be copied by others. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I hand over to my colleague, Dr. Paul Orton, who will present you the option number three. Thank you very much. Um, Paul, could you please uh, switch on your camera and your audio, please? We can't hear anything. Thank you. And could you start again, please? Okay, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and apologies for the technical hitches as I uh, failed to press the right buttons in the right sequence. So uh, hopefully you can hear me and you can see the screen. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about a model uh, involving cloud-based fees that would rethink uh, the global life science infrastructure as a form of social enterprise. The revenue generated under this model would return monetary benefits to biodiversity uh, conservation through some form of multilateral fund. And it would also uh, support the life science uh, infrastructure. So over the last 15 years, the world has witnessed a, a kind of explosion uh, in the volume of digital data. That data is stored and processed in a worldwide network of data centers and data services that make up the cloud. As ordinary consumers, we use the cloud every time we say use our phone to store photos with Google, Microsoft or Apple. Some of us will pay monthly subscription fees of about, say, $8 a month uh, for these extra storage services. And these services, subscriptions, along with pay-as-you-go, which we're all familiar with from mobile phones, are part of a range of commercial pricing models developed by Amazon and Google and so on, with a market uh, value last year of US uh, $227 billion dollars. So these cloud services are big uh, business. Now, researchers in the life sciences, if we look at our user, who's a life science researcher, at the bottom of the screen, they normally obtain data from open access sequence databases free of charge. But in reality, these costs are met by taxpayers through their funding bodies. As the scale of data, uh, life science sequence data has expanded and demands for services has changed to address this uh, scale, the life science infrastructure is starting to come under strain. So to give you an idea, a single next generation sequencing machine will generate about two petabases of sequence data a year. The existing NCBI, US NCBI sequence read archive has around 100 terabases of data in it at the moment. Now, the response to these kind of challenges or stresses and strains on the system, for example, the NCBI is starting to transfer the entire sequence read archive onto Amazon and Google cloud servers. Under this approach, 
uh, NCBI continues to make the data, the data available in open access terms. However, researchers will have to pay if they want to move the data around or if they want to use services such as large scale uh, parallel processing and analytics tools. So under this model, open access to sequence data would continue, but researchers seeking, say, to use data above a certain level or to use particular specialist analysis services would pay fees to use the infrastructure. The revenue from those fees would pass to some form of multilateral fund for biodiversity conservation, and a proportion of that would pass to support the infrastructure, for example, the infrastructure in developing countries. Now, in terms of pros and cons, which I'm just going to flick forward to if I can. So this would clearly require some new arrangements within the existing life science infrastructure. It would also require the willingness uh, to make the necessary changes within that infrastructure. The, fund, the public funding bodies who presently support the existing infrastructure would need to uh, be willing to make a move to more of a social enterprise model using cloud-based fees. And researchers would need to in, uh, accommodate uh, and anticipate the costs of cloud-based fees in making developing their funding applications. On the pro side, this is highly scalable and can accommodate growth. Uh, as sequence data grows, revenue also grows. It responds to changing demands for services uh, and reflects existing trends. I think importantly, principles such as pay as you go are very easy to understand. They're transparent and fair. Pay by use is a transparent and fair principle. And finally, this addresses uh, the long-term sustainability challenges to the database uh, infrastructure. And uh, finally, I'm going to uh, pass over to uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Claudia Seat from uh, the University of Ghent and uh, the University of Bonn to talk about commons licenses for DSI. Uh, Claudia, I uh, believe that you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. I have been assigned in the team to present option four, and I will now briefly outline the background, the core concept, and the pros and cons of this option. So what is the background of the model of common licenses for DSI? This option is based on the model of the Creative Commons licensing system for copyright works, under which today over 1 billion works are online across millions of websites, such as YouTube by Google or Wikipedia. The assumption underlying this model is that lessons can be learned from the open source movement of software development on how to keep access open for digital content. It seeks to apply such lessons learned to DSI, especially since common licenses have already been increasingly extended to digital biodiversity data. So coming to the diagram. Um, Ah, so wait a moment, this was the first one. So what is uh, the uh, option based on? This option is based on, on, on the model of the, um, uh, what is the core concept of this model? Turning to the core concept of this uh, option, as you will see from the diagram, the model of common licenses for DSI would be based on a licensing system based on four standardized types of licenses as you will see in the left upper corner of the diagram. All four types focus on the creation of simple and open licenses that set out clear terms for the use of DSI and maintain open access. They would be similar to the Creative Commons licenses in copyright and which allow the creator of a scientific or literary work to share their work based on defined basic conditions set out in standard licenses, which are both human and machine readable. When applied to DSI in public sequence databases like INSDC, this would facilitate the creation and maintenance of open access repositories of DSI. The user can then search the public sequence databases, including the license type, and choose which sequence data to use. The provider countries would select one of the four standardized licenses, which are pre-negotiated at the international level in the context of pick and mat. 
As you see in the diagram on the right-hand side, the four standardized licenses, which could be applied to DSI, um, and which are directly adapted from the Creative common, uh, Commons would be the following. First, the public domain data made available for any use without restrictions or particular requirements on the part of the users. That means no right reserved and the data are explicitly committed to the public domain. Second, the attribution data made available for any use as well, including commercial use, providing that the creator and or the party is attributed and the third option is uh, the attributions share like the creator and or the party must be attributed here as well and any future modification to the DSI must be shared on the same terms as the original license and the fourth uh, uh, possibility the attribution non-commercial data are made available for any use provided that attribution is given and provided that the use is not for commercial use Thus, this license requires attribution and generally restricts use to non-commercial. In case of the possibility of a commercial use, there's also the possibility of a change of intent that could be foreseen in a clause in, 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 in the license that requires the negotiation of benefit sharing in the case of commercial use. Different categories of DSI could be covered by different licenses, such as, for example, the following three in particular, first, historical DSI and DSI from observer states like the US would retroactively have license one applied to all non-human DSI. Uh, second, countries that do not require prior informed consent, that means most of the more, uh, northern EU member states could choose between the license one, two, three. And uh, in addition, countries requiring prior informed consent in the form of access or equivalent permits for the collection uh, within that jurisdiction could likely require the use of license four. Moving to the diagram further to the right from the standard license option, you will see that option four offers the three uh, possibility pathways for monetar uh, monetary benefit sharing. Finally, as you will see on the right bottom corner of the diagram regarding the recipients of any funds generated, they would be channeled to direct country payments or multilateral fund for biodiversity conservation and sustainable use. Coming now to the pros and cons, uh, I would like to start first uh, with the challenges. Um, the cons, uh, first of all, an international agreement on standardized license conditions could be challenging. The parties will be confronted with challenges in negotiation, negotiating the checks and definitions of standard licenses that would be important for the successful operation of this option. However, this option could be could build on experience uh, in the field of copyright management for creative works, software and related international process. So we have already background for that. As a second uh, uh, disadvantage, there's a risk of license proliferation. If users or parties are given the opportunity to elaborate individual license provisions, perceived to be specific to their circumstances or, their, or interests. And the uh, uh, last uh, challenge would be um, that, uh, that, that, that refers to the risk of the secondary licensing, where efforts are made to impose restrictive licenses on top of the original standard licenses. And uh, coming now to the uh, uh, positive side, uh, first and foremost, this option clearly promotes the open sharing of resources and collaborations around resources. Based on existing and long-standing global experience, open licensing models demonstra demonstrate work in promoting the open sharing of resources and collaborations around resources. Second uh, positive side advantage would be that commons and open source licenses are by no key foundation of the modern knowledge economy already and they have they are central to the emergence of open science commons licenses are increasingly applied to biodiversity data and are routinely used to make publications open access and last but not least um, yeah, i would also stress that real uh, relatively speaking option four would offer a simple system for all stakeholders that does not require new infrastructure with live infrastructure, it would make it simple for DSI users to access data openly and nevertheless credit parties for providing GR used to produce DSI. Now I would like to hand over to my colleague Carolina for the next option for the blockchain option. 
Hello, thank you, Claudia. Um, yes, so that these are my slides. So uh, I will talk about the option on blockchain. Um, and blockchain technology is mainly known for its uh, use in cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. And since then, it has been extensively considered and studied for different applications in science. Basically, blockchain is a computing structure that allows the sharing of record or digital data in a protected space or in blocks. In these blocks, they, not, they cannot be altered without all involved parties noticing it due to cryptographic tools. It is also a distributed dist uh, infrastructure that connects all parties to a chain of records and different parties can validate and verify transactions not needing an intermediary to do this job. And many stakeholder groups in uh, the ABS discussions have mentioned uh, blockchain as a potential tool to help monitor the sharing of DSI by linking it to ABS measures from provider countries. Uh, some of them uh, by this mean that using a blockchain to block the DSI and having it shared in a protected, in a controlled environment. This approach has two fundamental problems. First, it goes against the open sharing practices and uh, open access structures. And as mentioned before by many of the speakers, these are critical tools for doing science in modern days. And secondly, it is actually unfeasible to do so because, because uh, sharing the SI within a blockchain would require huge computational power, storage space, ending up being costly, unsustainable, and also limiting greatly the amount of uh, possible transactions in the sharing system. Uh, trying to change the slide. Well, uh, maybe here. Yes, okay. So what we attempted to do uh, in this option is to investigate a way of using blockchain technology in this context without compromising the current open access system. So one way of doing that is by constructing a separate blockchain system that would function in parallel to the current uh, sharing platform, such as the INSDC. In this way, the DSI would not be shared within a blockchain, but will continue to be shared as before, including in the public domain. The blockchain would serve as a monitoring layer where conditions and transactions can be re recorded and tracked. One natural question at, at this point is that if the users, they can freely access the DSI from the public domain, why would them feel compelled to put extra work on registering uh, conditions and transactions within a blockchain layers? One natural incentive is legal certainty as most users are willing to perform due diligence and be confident they are complying to any existing conditions. If there is a system that can make these conditions visible, easily accessible, understandable, and actionable, this is an added value. A blockchain and its tracking system can also serve as an administrative and monitoring tool for both providers and users, as it can not only link the DSI to the ABS measures, but also other important records such as patent applications, publications, R&D steps and contributions, and even genetic resources in physical collections. So one could still argue that for uh, data providers to, and users to completely rely on the willingness of performing due diligence might not be enough incentives for the widely adoption of the system. So one extra incentive could be to submit in-depth contextual metadata linked to the DSI within a blockchain layer of records. In this way, all users that uh, register in a blockchain and agree to the existing conditions are able to access a wider range of metadata and perform more extensive analysis. The details of how the system actually works in practice can be seen on the white paper, although even there is a simplification of all the system's uh, technical functionalities, but it basically depends on creating interfaces and links across systems and registering within a blockchain layer uh, metadata if, if wanted, any terms and conditions in the form of smart contracts and important events such as access, uh, transfers, types of use, change of intent in, in use and benefits shared. So going to the last slide, yeah. So in relation to the pros and cons, starting with the cons, um, 
one potential risk of the system is by creating this uh, protected environment that metadata that before was being shared in the open access system is transferred uh, to the controlled layer. To address this, it's important that in the adopted governance plan is clearly mentioned uh, which data, metadata is agreed to be shared in a blockchain layer, as well as the realization by all stakeholders that the more the DSI is shared, the more benefits are produced. Uh, it is also based on a relatively new technology that can be highly complex and uh, mastered only by a few. In addition, there are no proofs of principle for applying the blockchain technological features to this specific context. So a lot of piloting and assessments are still needed, such as in terms of cost effectiveness, fitness of smart contracts, legal validation and enforcement, and even capacity for widely adoption. So the short term implementation of this option might not be realistic. In the pro side, the idea of the system is for users that do not want to share their data in the open access system because they are concerned of losing control over it. They have an alternative where they can still use the open access, but at the same time, indicate conditions and monitor transactions. In addition, a blockchain, as mentioned, can serve to alleviate administrative burdens by linking the DSI to any existing metadata, legal conditions and documentations, and uh, important events throughout the R&D cycle. Besides, it can also enforce other types of uh, benefit sharing, such as non-monetary benefit sharing, which are very relevant for science. Um, so uh, I would like to pass the room now to my colleague Torsten, uh, that will give the last presentation of this block. Thank you very much, Carolina. And as you saw from these various options, it is really important that we have supporting structures for implementation. And so I will talk now about public-private partnerships as such a supporting structure. Next slide, please. The public-private partnership approach is all about encouraging a broad stakeholder engagement. And as I saw from the questions, a question already arose around industry. This is a space where industry can fully engage. A public-private partnership approach provides the opportunity to develop a tailored solution that is nimble and adaptive. So we have a structure where we can start with a needs-based assessment and then design the structure and the process accordingly. And we can do that directly with public and private stakeholders. And private stakeholders includes industry, includes civil society, includes all parts of, of, of the chain. A key component that we can deliver through this process is an upfront investment into solutions. So from a time value of money, we don't need to rely on receiving funds in the longer term. We can spend the money upfront using, for instance, innovative finance mechanisms. And we see this in the present uh, vaccination efforts through Gavi. We see this in, in the way we address COVID. If you want to move quickly, you need to bring all the parties together. You can use innovative finance. You can use um, funding mechanisms to bring money in upfront to actually deliver solutions. And this also facilitates interactions amongst the different private sector players. For corporations, there are often antitrust issues concerning cooperation. Having this kind of a format allows overcoming that. And um, bringing in non-contracting parties, um, both from the observer side, but also the various subnational players, whether it's from the state of California to a local um, and regional authority, all of these relevant parties can be brought to the table to help deliver the solutions we are discussing. And in that form, a public-private partnership really is a test bed for policy experimentation, for implementation that will allow to deliver significant funds and support to a DSI implementation solution. And with this short summary, I will pass back to Rachel. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Well, as you can see, there's a very, very um, active set of uh, engagements happening within the audience. I'm feeling a bit dizzy by it all, actually. I'm, I'm, I'd rather be in a room where I can only take three questions at a time than have to deal with um, the sort of myriad of comments that are coming through. But fabulous. And I think a lot of them can be discussed in the chat box themselves, as I think they are being done and will be responded to after the webinar as well. So rest assured that your points are not going to, to go awry if they're not dealt with now. But I think there, I mean, there's some really, really interesting um, common themes that are coming through. Um, you know, one of them is about who pays, and it's not a, it's not a specific uh, question to any panelist, but I think there, there are a number of questions coming through about the additional burden of the levies on, on researchers themselves and particularly those who aren't necessarily um, commercial researchers. So if, if, if somebody could respond to that, I think it would be helpful and would address several of the comments that have come through now. Yeah, and can everybody that presented an option turn their cameras on now too, so that... Exactly. Um, I was just gonna remind everyone. And again, um, we appreciate the very active um, chat happening, uh, please restrict questions in the Q&A box and comments in the chat section. So it'll be easier for us to see through. Thank you. Um, maybe with respect As to the finance question you all just raised, maybe I could start. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. then talk to them, thank you. Um, because so it, it was, uh, the point was raised, especially with respect to the micro levies, but I guess it's, it applies more broadly to the policy options that so perhaps some of the others could also link to this. Um, <clears throat> so we, we have been thinking within the context of the micro levy also of possible uh, exceptions for particular uh, consumers of the products and services that the levy would be charged on. Um, this is also happening in other contexts, but if you do that, of course, that makes it more complicated. And so the advantages of the model in terms of uh, limited need for monitoring and, and, and tracing, uh, tracking and tracing, you would lose some of that if you start creating as exceptions, because of course you need to check whether indeed the people that uh, uh, think that they qualify for an exception actually do. So we have focused on the fact that the levy should remain relatively low. There was also a question, what does that mean, low? Uh, in the report, you find some illustrations of uh, the levies that are charged um, within the context of unit eight. Um, so that's really, it depends on whether it's an international flight or um, a domestic flight. So there is some differentiation possible. But so that's really like between uh, two to 60 uh, euros. So on uh, other types of sequencing services, laboratory reagents, the, the amount should also be limited in that respect in a similar way, like you see for the airline uh, uh, ticket levy. So I hope that that gives some clarification on, on some of the points that were raised. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Esther. Torsten, could you add to that? Uh, sure, and I think what we were trying to show with the public-private partnership approach is that by turning it around, by identifying what the needs really are, where money could be effectively be deployed, and by bringing in a broad range of potential funders, including voluntary funding mechanisms, we really address this financing issue in a different way. It's not about what is the additional burden? It is about what is the investment opportunity for the participants to actually make the system work better for everyone. And that way of shifting the perspective really helps to address this, this financing issue. Thank you very much. Um, I think, yeah. I think uh, two additional questions, yeah. Yeah, um, I found, so I'm going to be uh, reading the questions from the Q&A box. Um, I found one for option four, that's the commons licenses. And it mentions, it states, um, who within countries is responsible for choosing which license is appropriate? The research group, the national focal points, government, given the rate of DSI generation, how can we ensure countries have the capacity to deal with this workload? 
just try to answer. It's uh, it, it it depends on uh, on on the negotiation who will sign the license agreement. So this could be done by by different uh, uh, organization of uh, level in, in a country. So um, it needs to be decided. It's it's not yet uh, uh, we have not yet discussed this who will be responsible within a country. Uh, for signing the license agreement, I guess it will be uh, determined when the, the license agreement uh, will be signed. Who is with the contracting party in that? Paul, do you want to add in our ideas on standardization? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I mean, just to just to respond, I mean, there are already uh, many hundreds of millions of these uh, licenses uh, available online, uh, which is is really a, a mark of their success. I think uh, for DSI specifically, there would need to be some kind of agreement between um, parties to the relevant uh, environmental agreements that they wanted to adopt this approach. That need to be that might include some principles about what the basic elements of particular classes of license might be to classify as a commons license for digital sequence information. And I think it would be probably a, a matter for the relevant um, national focal points uh, and so involved to decide who uh, is going to issue the licenses. But in terms of the technology, the technology for issuing these licenses through the Creative Commons uh, is extremely easy to use. I hope that helps. Thanks very much, Paul. We're running a little bit over and um, there will still be time for engagement on these options after we have a, a short reflection from from two experts who haven't um, been involved in, in the authoring of the report, but are very much deeply involved in these issues. Um, and the first is Dr. Hugo Maria Scully, who's held several high level positions in the European Commission, and he's currently head of the unit for multilateral environmental cooperation in the Directorate for Global Sustainable Development in DG Environment of the, of the Commission. And the second person is Melenia Nelly Munoz Garcia, who's the ABS National Focal Point at the National Commission for Biodiversity Management in the Ministry of Environment and Energy in Costa Rica. And this really is an opportunity, I think, for them to be reflecting on these uh, options that have been presented and giving you know, some of their own insights as, as to the workability um, and feasibility of these options. So I'm going to hand over first to Hugo um, to give us a few minutes of reflection. Um, um, uh, sorry, Rachel, could Melania take over, please? I'm fine with it, I'm here, so. Uh, okay, okay. That's, that's, okay. I mean, I've, it's up to you, but I mean, it's like just saying that, yes, I'm here. Okay, perfect. So, but I'm, then, then I'm fine. fine with Melina going first as well. So there's really no issue. Just wanted to flag that. Okay, thank so should you. I go? Should okay. I go ahead? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Rachel. And uh, the chat on the comments on the question and answers. And uh, uh, thank you very much for all the, the thoughts presented. And I think that uh, as the uh, lead negotiator for the European Union on that topic, uh, I think this has been already a fascinating afternoon. Uh, and I would like to preface what I'm going to say, however, that I'm here, as you rightly pointed out, Rachel, as an expert, and that I do not pretend in what I will share with you to speak on behalf of the EU in any way. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, I would also like to recall that uh, I have been with this topic of ABS uh, for the better part of 16 years because I was already involved in the running up to the negotiations of the Nagoya Protocol, was the lead negotiator during the negotiations for the protocol and was piloting the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol in the European Union for the first two years after its entry into force. And I think that uh, already at the time we negotiated the Nagoya Protocol, it was clear that uh, there were ways of uh, uh, taking, to drawing benefits from uh, uh, genetic resources that were not strictly linked to the physical possession of a genetic resource or a sample. And uh, that was already coming even clearer at the time of the Hyderabad 
uh, meeting of the part, conference of the parties and even more clear in uh, Pyongyang. And I think that uh, the uh, scientific and technological progress has brought additional challenges in, in, that, in that regard. I think that uh, uh, the, the issue that I see is that uh, we do see the, on the one hand, the uh, importance and the benefits that open access has brought to the scientific community, but beyond the scientific community to the world at large, both in benefits for biodiversity, but for, uh, for, for society. But on the other hand, the legitimate expectation by uh, countries that are in line with the CBD uh, sovereign of their natural natural resources that they would expect that the third uh, objective of the CBD uh, would be fully implemented as they understand it. And I think that's where, they, uh, where the problem starts. And I think that uh, the, um, uh, this presentations this afternoon, one could see that uh, we were putting in looking at this, the, the leg legalities of the international uh, legal instruments aside and focusing very much on uh, what would be options that could uh, make it possible to maintain uh, an open science approach, uh, but uh, binding the open science approach into something uh, more, uh, uh, more um, you know, akin to the third objective of the um, uh, of the of the CBD. And I think that uh, when you walk through the uh, uh, the different options presented, uh, you can see that there is a dichotomy or a tension between. Uh, on the one hand, practicability and uh, ease of access versus a stringency with regard to the, uh, uh, main to maintaining the link between the country of origin and the genetic resource as, as expressed in DSI. And also uh, a quite a, uh, a widespread of consideration with regard to the how heavy the instrument would be and how much uh, the, would it actually generate and how much it would actually cost uh, the, uh, the, to, to do it. Now, uh, I think that from, 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 from my point of view, uh, coming back to where I'm, where I'm sitting, uh, we, are, we were among the first ones to ratify. We were among the few that uh, immediately established compliance measures and the only one with comprehensive and binding measures. Now, uh, I think that uh, from, from, from our perspective, uh, we need to look at uh, options and we need to look at ways to maintain the open science benefits. And it is, from my perspective, less beneficial or uh, uh, accessible now for countries that are less technologically advanced, but all scientists across the globe benefit from open science. Uh, then to say that even with that, there is enormous amount of what is happening now, going back to, to scenario zero that Guy presented uh, in terms of capacity building and technology transfer. Uh, but uh, even if we from our part was of the opinion that that actually is sufficient, it is not sufficient for many parties of the uh, uh, of the CBD who think that the issue of benefit sharing from the use of DSI will need to be addressed at the next uh, uh, COP. And I think that uh, uh, the, uh, what we lacked in the negotiations of the Nagoya Protocol was such a deep engagement by the scientific community that we have now. Because at the time I had the feeling that the scientific community had the feeling like we are the good guys and we are actually not con concerned by that at all. And I think there was a, a great disappointment in the scientific community when they discovered after the fact that the Nagoya Protocol and the implementation rather was applicable to them, lock, stock and barrel. And I think that uh, the scientific world has learned from this experience and is now investing, and we're very grateful for that, a lot in communicating uh, what the needs are, what the contribution could be uh, to, to do that. So. Uh, the options that were presented today, uh, I would say all of them have advantages. Uh, all of them have pitfalls, but I think looking at them, I would actually say uh, that there is one 
uh, lesson that you, or one as a grid analysis grid that should be applied to all of the models saying the simple uh, model is the more chances we will have that it will be successful and the more chances that they will deliver the expected results and the exact result from the point of view of many of our partners is that it will over time generate monetary benefits to be shared that can actually uh, go into the uh, 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 conservation and sustainable use of uh, 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 DSI of, of the biodiversity. Now, I think that uh, um, I heard one thing early on that was stressed and I cannot really underline it anymore. And it was, I think if it was Amber, but I'm not sure, uh, saying that uh, the value of DSI is not in the DSI itself, it's in the possibility of comparison that that one DSI is not worth much. So in, in order to uh, ensure that the scientific development is re re remains relevant and is it, it can actually contribute is important that scientists have access to a to a whole set of data or a range of data set if only one sequence is included from such such a set it really uh, sort of uh, uh, diminishes the return on the investment in that regard uh, we uh, do want to say also and i think i firmly believe in it uh, there is huge advantage in maintaining the open access because it has benefited a lot along the world. Now, uh, I've heard also uh, quite some voices also seeing in the chat saying, oh, well, yes, great, blockchain is the solution. And, uh, um, and that allows us to transpose in some way a bilateral system also on DSI. And I think that uh, we have to say that, the, uh, uh, that setting up such a system would be extremely costly extremely heavy and likely requiring extra money to be put for the efforts of tracking and tracing rather than generating and sharing benefit. Uh, I think that this one thing that strikes me is that all systems that uh, or all modalities that are being proposed that have uh, sort of a uh, that are heavy on the mechanics and on the tools are most likely to uh, require years to develop be heavy in operating costs and therefore eat up a lot of the possible monetary benefits that could exchange. So I think that's one of the things that you should continue to look at as you debate those issues. Now, those were a couple of personal observations from my side, and I'm really keen to hear uh, my co-panelist Melania on to give her perspective on it and, of course, react to questions and uh, comments that you have in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hugo. Over to you, Melania. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Hugo. Uh, I'm very glad to be part of this event. Thank you very much for the organizers for inv inv inviting me. And uh, thank you, you all, for the development of this paper. I think it's a very, very good uh, step forward to discuss this huge and complicated topic. I think when we are in front of the complex thing, the best uh, way to afford it is to go step by step, right? So do not try to afford the big snowball, but trying to divide it in smaller pieces and try to solve the problem with small steps. And I think this, this is a very important step, trying to develop options. A few years ago, when we started discussing this topic, we just, had this huge panorama and see like a very complex thing in front of us. But now I think we have been clarifying different uh, options as were presented in this forum. And we have also participated in the ATTE group trying to define the other side of the discussion that is what is exactly DSI, what we, what we are talking about. So I think the ATTE group then ad hoc technical expert group of the, on DSI made a very good report about it. My recommendation for the participants in this panel is to go through and, and read these options because I think this is the other, the other side of the coin we should start uh, discussing. Um, I think it's very positive to start thinking about 
the use, the, the open use of DSI and the benefit sharing could have a good marriage, right? They could be integrated and we should uh, find uh, the, be the best option where several stakeholders are uh, happy with that. So I think uh, from our perspective, we don't want to stop the open access of DSI. We think that the benefits obtained by the use of this DSI uh, for the first two objectives of the CDV, that is conservation of biodiversity, but also sustainable use of biodiversity is very important. The ability for our researchers to compare their sequences and find out different functions of those sequences and and different uses of those sequences is very important. And also um, for conservation, right? For make better decisions about uh, management of different species and ecosystems and identify species and everything the, the scientists already mentioned during their presentations. So I think um, it is very, very important to to maintain these kind of non-monetary benefits of the use of DSI for conservation and sustainable use, but also it's important to try to find a way to actually share monetary benefits for the use, the commercial use of this uh, information of these sequences. I think in, uh, it's very important because there are a lot of companies trying to develop product, cosmetic products, pharmaceutical products. There are huge companies that could uh, also participate the benefits with, with the provider countries. And we have been thinking that in this moment, according to the scale of use of DSI, we could be facing uh, a big transaction number. The scale is big as it was mentioned. There are a lot of sequences and one research program or one research project can use hundreds or thousands of sequences, right? Um, but when we go through the um, commercial use, probably there are few less uh, sequences that could be used in the development of an, a specific product. So I think on one side, talking about this big scale, we have no option than a multilateral system. The multilateral system has been a topic that has been discussed during years on the CDB. And I think the key here is try, is, is not, well, is decide we need probably this multilateral system, but also work in the design of this multilateral system, right? How, how the, the money is gonna come into the fund, but also how these, these funds are gonna be distributed among the countries and how different provider countries could use those monetary benefits uh, resulting of DSI. And on the other hand, uh, we agree that Probably the, the bilateral system is difficult to apply when we have a lot of transactions, when we have a lot of sequences from different countries that could be used in a single project. But personally, I think that it, the, the ABS permit is not possible to be asked before to use the sequence because as I said, there are many sequences and there, there could be from different countries with different legislations. But I think one of the options could be declare when you register uh, a new commercial product or where you have a patent application, declare if you use DSI and if you know the origin, the country origin. We have now tools to determine the, own, the, the country origin, the, the country tag in the databases. And I think if it is possible, bilateral or direct monetary benefits to the provider country is desired. But on the other hand, we know we, we are conscious that this is not always possible and we are open to um, this will work on the design and implementation of a multilateral system where the transactions are um, 
so many. So just to, to close up a little bit, it is, it is important, the benefit, the non-monetary benefit sharing for the utilization of DSI in conservation and sustainable use, but we, have, we cannot forget about the third objective of um, the CDB, and we should work on the development of options and mechanisms that could uh, ensure the monetary benefit sharing for the commercial use of DSI. Thank you. There are a number of questions coming in to both of you, but I wanted to start off with one, which is about, I think there, I mean, there seem to be two assumptions um, with regard to benefit sharing. And the one is that the non-monetary benefit sharing would be linked to capacity building in some way that's linked to genomics and biotech. Um, that to me is an assumption that probably hasn't gone through uh, any kind of sort of inclusive process of discussion. Um, so is, is, that, is that something that's sort of well accepted, that that's the, the kind of form of capacity building that, that we're thinking of? Um, and then the second assumption, I think, is that any monetary benefits would be directed towards conservation. A, a very, um, let's say, a, a great report in that regard, in that ABS and conservation haven't been strongly linked um, since 1992. So, so how can we be assured, and this is also questions I think coming from the audience, how can we be assured that such benefits would be directed towards conservation? So if you could, if you could both uh, briefly respond to those uh, questions and I'll be gathering others from the audience now, thanks. Hugo first or Melania first, which, which one? Melania, you, you, want, you look I like can, you're ready. I can go first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think uh, capacity building in, in terms of genetic resources and biochemical resources is key for all the countries, mainly developing countries. I think this capacity building is, is really important in order to the countries be able to produce and analyze and use uh, DSI, not just for conservation, but also for, for, for sustainable use, right? Try to develop new, new uh, products and new um, systems could help to solve important problems as we have as contamination and, and other things and problems we have in agriculture and other um, uh, sectors that contribute to the economy in the different countries but also contribute to depleting biodiversity. So I think it is really important but sometimes is not in, in it's not enough, right? We should work on capacity building, but we also should work in other aspects. As I mentioned, try to develop a system or mechanism that could ensure monetary benefits from the use of commercial, uh, the commercial use of, of DSI. And I think it's really important to guide this. Um, capacity building according to the necessities of different countries, because not all countries have the same capacity building needs. And it is important to, to ask the countries, right? To ask uh, which are your needs, what do you need? And transfer technology and transfer uh, the different ways we have in uh, managing DSI or also the different technologies other scientific research centers have been used um, with the genetic resources and DSI. And related, I think we should uh, work more on this. There are a lot of uh, benefits in conservation because a lot of studies, research studies that use genetic resources and share the benefits. Benefits also are related to conservation in Costa Rica. Big part, almost 50% of the ABS permits, permits are focused on 
uh, conservation or related topics as evolution and taxonomy that are important tools for conservation. But we have been used the, the results of this uh, research in order to, to define and, and um, manage in a better way our biodiversity. Actually, one of the important things we have developed in Costa Rica is in the report they have to present at the end of the ABS permit, they should give recommendations for conservation. So this, this, this section in, in the report make it uh, easier to understand for the conservation areas managers and for people that own the, the private reserve and so on to understand the genetic data and transform it and traduce it in and translate it into, into information, the people that are in the field and people that are uh, in charge of managing this biodiversity could understand and apply concrete actions into conservation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Melania. Yeah. And indeed, I think Costa Rica has sort of holds the flag uh, with regard to making that link between ABS and conservation, um, but it's probably not widely replicated. Hugo, over to you. Um, I, I have to say that um, I have to apologize. I'm, I have chosen today of all days to go back to the office after seven months and uh, work from here. And uh, that affects very negatively my my operational entity because some of my, 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 my hardware isn't connecting well as it would have before. So I'm, that's why I don't have a camera suddenly anymore. And that's why I have, I'm losing uh, connection time and again. So uh, if uh, what I'm saying is sometimes uh, incoherent with the questions asked that uh, you have to attribute it to that. And I apologize uh, to, to anybody uh, uh, about that. I mean, what I'm, uh, what I'm seeing in the chat and what I'm hearing in the discussion uh, is clearly fits with the general uh, discussion and the thinking uh, that we have in a way that uh, we need to account for uh, the non-monetary benefits and the, uh, and I just heard the, the comment also from Melania in the terms of the uh, corporate at uh, the uh, tech, tech transfer and capacity building that is happening. Uh, secondly, uh, that the uh, it very important is the link, and you said that yourself, Rachel, if I understood you correctly, the link between the benefits that would be generated and the uh, uh, biodiversity conservation and protection and sustainable use. And uh, also the issue of uh, how uh, would we uh, actually account for uh, the difference between some transaction costs with uh, the net benefits that would accrue to uh, the countries of origin. And I think that is all something that, that we need to put, take into account when uh, looking in the, uh, into this, the question. There's also issues raised with regard to uh, legal certainty, and I think has been raised by certain in, uh, certain in the chat. And uh, I think that in that regard, we, we have to see what type of political solution would be linked to uh, practical technical solutions. Because today, what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing is we're talking about uh, things that could be feasible and could be uh, operational, but not necessarily looking at what would be the legal basis for setting up such a system that is being discussed. And I think from, from my perspective, that is very important to understand that in the context of this workshop, we're actually not discussing the legal basis. We're not discussing what type of uh, legal solution uh, and political solution we would have to negotiate in the context of the CBD, but basically what would be solutions that would in the administrative and financial burden they create in terms of the uh, benefits that would accrue, uh, would preserve the advantages of uh, the open science system, while uh, trying to uh, ensure that a certain degree of uh, uh, monetary benefits flow that are linked to the utilization of genetic resources. So I think that, that those are some reflections that I have on the questions that are coming up in the chat. Thank you.
Thank you very much to, to both of you. So here's a provocative question, um, which is linked, I think, to others uh, earlier talking about Nagoya and whether the only solution is Nagoya and whether there isn't an option to, I guess, uh, disaggregate and divorce DSI from Nagoya in one way. So, so this question is um, from George Haringzo, Haring Hazen, who asks both Hugo and Melania to ensure that benefits will be used for biodiversity protection and promotion and for low capacity countries, is then not the only option, a multilateral system under a supranational national governance? Could you both respond to that, please? Well, thank you for, for the question. I think, uh, according to the discussions we have had in the region, in, in the Central American and Latin American region and the Caribbean, I think we are open, as I said, we are open. I'm not speaking in behalf of the region, right? But uh, according to the discussion and few people I have talked to, um, I think the multilateral system is, is necessary in this case. Um, is, it could be a good option, you know, for the huge amount of sequences and origin countries that have been used uh, when we use these databases. And I think it's a good option because in other ways, we, we don't have benefit sharing, we don't have the option of benefit sharing. But on the other side, if there could be the option for a direct benefit sharing with the provider country, it could be the best. I think is, I, I believe or I understand that this is not possible in most of the cases, but if it is possible for a few cases, I think we, we appreciate that, that option. Um, there are specific research uh, going on that I'm, we all understand that bio, biodiversity do not respect political boundaries, but, and they are widely distributed several or most of the species, but we also know that there are few species that are very specific for special environments in specific places. For example, the case of microorganisms living inside the, the volcanoes in Costa Rica, probably they are endemic, probably they are very unique characteristics and those characteristics could be used to develop products. And if we know that those sequences from, from those very unique organisms in Costa Rica, and we know we have the country tag and we have the option to link the benefit sharing that directly to the provider country, we could, or we appreciate that. I think we should try to develop these options for the scenarios where it is possible. Thank you. Thank you, Melania. Hugo. Thank you. I, uh, I have now switched to a different device and I hope you can see me now. I'm not sure whether that's an improvement over not seeing me, but that's another story. Uh, um, and uh, I have to say uh, by switching, I have lost all of the chat that I had before. So that's a little bit of a problem that I have. So uh, uh, since I was distracted due to the switching to the devices, could I ask you to very briefly, just rephrase the question that you had for, for, for Melania and myself. I really apologize for those technical difficulties. No, no problem. The question is, to ensure that benefits will be used for biodiversity protection and promotion and for low capacity countries, is, there only, is, is it not that the only option is a multilateral system under a supranational governance? Um, Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I would say that uh, the um, channeling monetary benefits through a uh, multilateral system under supranational uh, uh, supervision and control certainly will make it easier for uh, to adopt criteria for the utilization of that money for biodiversity conservation and sustainable use. I wouldn't go as far as to say that this is the only 
way to do it because uh, there could be certainly a possibility to come to such an agreement, also the context of the CVD and to apply that to the, um, to the, to the um, national legislation in that context. I think that, uh, but I would agree that it would be probably easier and easier to uh, retain control over such a system in a multilateral context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugo. I, mean, I think we, we're drawing to a close and I'd, I'd still like to open up to, to the rest of the, the panel and the report, the authors of the report to respond to some of the points coming through in this very engaged discussion and maybe looking forward to sort of next steps. And the one question that's come through in, in different ways is, you know, how, how is the scientific community responding to DSI? So is this report, um, how representative is this report of the wider scientific community? Um, and is, is there a common position on DSI? That's the first part of it. And then I think the second part of it is how does the scientific community plan to engage with policymakers to convey these kinds of views? So some responses from, from the group, please. Maybe all the speakers could turn on their cameras and audio, or now we could proceed. Well, maybe I, could I take a first crack at it, uh, Rachel? Because I think this is a really important question. And I would actually turn your question, how widespread is our scientific perspective amongst scientists everywhere? So we know users of the INSDC that it's around 15 million people around the world. So there's a lot of scientists out there and that's a great thing. But if you're sitting there in a country that's you know, not Germany or not France or Spain, where you've heard some of these authors today where we sit, um, go ask your own scientists, go ask them, go ask them how much they use DSI, if they use GenBank, if they use ENA or the DDBJ, if they use these databases, uh, whether or not they use DSI at, at all, if they're using national resources to put the sequence data in there and how they publish their data, how they publish their scientific results. And I, I think that's probably the best person that can answer your question is your own scientists. Our experience, and that's what we mentioned earlier, we've interviewed 37 people, but that's just a drop in the bucket. We've talked to 180 scientific stakeholders, mainly here um, in Europe. And we got pretty widespread consensus on, that, on this scientific perspective, but of course we don't speak for everyone. So I would say, if you really want to know, go ask your own scientists. And actually, that's the direct answer to your second question, Rachel, which was how to engage across. I think that um, regional dialogues could be really useful. And there is additional time here because of the pandemic where more dialogue can happen. And um, I think many of the people that spoke here today are also happy to do regional briefings. I'll mention that also towards the end. Maybe a short addition to that, just briefly. First, um, I had been pretty active in Peru uh, some years ago, and the most important issue of the Peruvian colleagues, and these were not microbiologists or anything, was what can be done to erect um, a node of GBIF in our country, because we need that free access to a biodiversity database. And a second short statement, I personally have never come across a scientist also in our international endeavors who would support a non-open um, access to, uh, to DSI and all other informations. I simply don't know anybody there. Thank you, Jörg. Are there any other responses from any other panelists? No? If not, I'll carry on. Um, Rachel, can I make a short comment? Sure. I, I think on this, on this um, what has just been said, I think the, the, what I see is that the scientific world and the political world is still not talking to each other. And I see still uh, worlds apart and uh, it's a typical case of a difficulty with a science policy interface. And I think that uh, there needs to be a, uh, a strong movement but to 
to actually convince scientists of all origins to actually speak up to their own governments and actually raise the issues of the benefits that are from open science and actually raising some of the issues that we've heard about today, because that's not what you hear in negotiation circles, uh, which at times is, I have to admit, uh, sometimes a little bit, uh, how would I say, uh, detached from uh, economic and scientific realities and sometimes stuck in ideological debates. And we don't need that here. We actually need more facts on the table. And I think discussions like that we have today uh, should also be repeated in a wider circle and actually the uh, what is coming through also shared with a wider circle of people that are responsible for establishing national positions so that national positions are established uh, really based on sound facts and science. Thank you. Are there any other responses? I would like to add a short comment. I think uh, what Hugo has mentioned is very important and uh, this integration with the scientists and also other sectors like industry and others is, is really important in order to develop the national positions for the discussion because all these decisions are, are will, will be made in, in the COP, in the CDB, right? So it is really important to involve different stakeholders as, as we did. I think it was a very good experience in South Africa and the DSI dialogue. And I think involve different stakeholders is not gonna be easy, but I think is, is a good approach in order to have an integrated uh, uh, system and, and a system in which we could all be as happy as possible <laughs> around this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Melania. I think there's one more question that's coming through uh, quite, quite a lot and I, it would be good to just have a, a response to that before I hand over to Amber to wrap up. And that's that uh, there seems to be a um, sort of a feeling that the report is largely dealing with a research community and academic research community rather than a commercial research community. And that the, the understanding of commercial use um, is perhaps uh, not as clear as it could be and the, the benefits arising from commercial use. Um, how, how could the team respond to that? Well, I mentioned we did the three uh, stakeholder workshops and our first and our second one were primarily focused on academic users, although we were lucky to have input from a variety of um, private sector scientists. Um, our third workshop was in July and it was explicitly focused on um, private sector industrial scientists. and it was very interesting to hear their perspectives. At the same time, I will also openly say, um, I think my sense from the workshop is that there's a reluctance at this point to actively um, discuss policy mechanisms. And so there, because this group was very clear that we wanted to move in that direction, we found ourselves at a bit of a stalemate to further engage. But if there's additional interest in further discussion, I think that this group of more um, academically focused uh, scientists would love to continue this discussion that I'm sure the policymakers as well. Um, but it's just a sort of a strategic question of, of whether or not we, we can't speak for everybody. We don't claim to speak for everybody. Um, we don't even all agree amongst ourselves for sure. Um, but that dialogue it, um, has not been as um, productive yet um, as uh, it perhaps could be. There was another interesting question on BLAST. I know it's a bit technical, but if I don't know if Guy wanted to, he wrote in the chat that he wanted to take it live, if you would. Sure. Yeah, I can, can if there's time. I, I mean, the reason I, 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 I clicked on that one is because I think it brings a, it brings a really good example of, of, of something that everyone does all the time in science with uh, sequence data. Um, that just show how it's it needs to be used holistically and, and needs to have this this open accessibility. 
Um, and so for those of you that don't know, a blast search is where you have an unknown sequence. You, you maybe derive a new sequence from something and you search it against all previously existing sequences in the public databases. So you search against everything that's previously existed and you find the matches. And when you find those matches, you look to understand what, what the biology of the sequences or what the biology of the organisms that produce the sequences already in the database are. And you can connect your, or you can infer uh, biological function and, 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 and different aspects of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the science around the sequence that you're querying from everything that's come before. If you change the database that you're searching, if you remove just one sequence actually in principle, then your results will be different, only marginally different, but they'll be different. And so everything, everything counts. And, and just, and, and in a way, it, a sequence, while it has this very limited value on its own, it has a value in this, in, in this whole. And, and it may well be that a sequence from a particular country has become really important in a blast search, but it's not the top result. It's not the thing that gave some information, but it was really important for allowing the thing that did give that information to be at the top of the results set. And so the question was, I think, um, is, is blast search, does that represent usage? Uh, and, and that depends on your, your interpretation. It depends on what system we, we, we move towards. Um, but if it does, then it means that everyone who is contributing a sequence into the system, who, who has an organism within their country, ha has to be attributed in some way um, uh, by, if we have a very direct system, they have to be attributed in some way because the person at the end who's used the, who's done the blast search has actually used their sequence to some extent. And it strikes me that that is such a, such a, a deep and complex mesh of, of attribution and tracking uh, that we would be foolish to, to try to go down that route. And Guy, how many blast searches run on your servers every day? I actually don't know. Um, that can be found out, but it's many, many, many. It's, it's the default. It, it's like Googling something for, for, a, for a scientist using sequence. It's, it's as frequent as that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Guy, for that clarification. That's really, really interesting. Um, we are unfortunately running out of time. I feel we could spend a week on this. And there, there's quite a few suggestions about next steps and you know, convening um, different kinds of webinars focused on different themes. Amber, I'm going to hand over you, to you because I, I assume you have some good proposals for how to take this forward. Well, my daddy always said, when you assume you make an ass out of you and me, but, um, but I hope you're right, we'll see. <laughs> It's a bit of a southern joke. Um, so yeah, I had some ideas about next steps. I guess the first thing I wanted to do was to do maybe a little bit of next steps for the project itself. I'm trying to advance slides and it's not going. There we go. Uh, the first thing is a stay tuned. There's also a little yellow box in the white paper, which is to say um, we have another sort of side arm of this project that you didn't hear anything about today which is an interactive database that colleagues at Yentes Institute at the IPK and Gottesleben have built up, which is a, um, based upon a, a big dump of data from uh, Guy's group at ENA, um, where we're able to take um, 8 million sequences that have both the country of origin and a publication associated with them and figure out and show in a visually interactive way which countries are using which data. And so I used the, the data from Melanie's home country from Costa Rica, uh, just to give you a snapshot of what that data will look like. So for example, Costa Rica has a population of 5 million. They have 4,750 users in Costa Rica. So scientists, bi biologists probably. Um, and as you can see from this first uh, shot, uh, yeah, again, the animation, there are 48 countries that use Costa Rican DSI and then if you look in the other direction, there are 28 countries whose Costa Rican scientists use their DSI. And this kind of gives you a snapshot of the interactive nature of DSI use and why, for example, a bilateral system is just gonna be a really, really tricky thing. Um, so the, the take home message here um, is really that if you want to see more data like this for your country, wherever you might be in the world, that this um, project is very, very open um, with this data set and with others that we've used, for example, for the CBD study on databases, 
um, to give you a regional or a country specific briefing. It could be a half an hour, it can be 45 minutes. We can try to connect with regional partners through our networks, or maybe you bring your own scientists along. Um, but we would love to, to share this tool that will go online very soon with you. Um, the second, I guess, outreach is that we would love um, if you're a DSI scientist, there's been some even in the chats already, and you feel like you would like to put your voice forward in this process, as Jens also alluded to, um, we are going to try to organize kind of an outreach network to, to communicate some of these ideas. And as Hugo and, and many others have mentioned, and as Rachel and um, Sarah Laird's uh, publication call for, this is the moment, I think, where scientific input can be really helpful. So we're going to try to organize something. I don't know how how that will work, but it's something we feel very um, passionate about. And finally, if you're a network or some kind of an international or umbrella organization, um, we would also be very interested in, in, a, in a broader kind of also DSI crash course um, webinar. So stay tuned. Um, and I guess perhaps the very last thing is back to the paper itself. So these are sort of the take home messages that you find on the very last paper of the um, very last page of the white paper. First, we think that it's a false choice. We think that the discussions over the last few years have often said it's either benefit sharing around DSI or it's open access. And this paper basically tests that or and says, can't it be an and? That open DSI is responsible and Guy showed you this and, and Yvonne as well for a vast amount of global non-monetary benefit sharing and we don't wanna mess that up. That open access, DSI, and benefit sharing can be compatible, but it's hard. And each of these five options took a lot of brain power, and they're all imperfect, and none of them are a panacea. They're really to give the international community something to shoot at, to, to, to test out, to say this is bad, start over, think here, or to mix and match. And there are sections to that effect in the paper. So now we think really is the time to ask, can access and benefit sharing and digital sequence information together support rather than hinder our shared long-term goal of conserving biodiversity and building up a robust, sustainable bioeconomy. And we hope this is the very beginning of a deeper and more extensive conversation. Back to you, Rachel. Well, Amber, thank you so much. I'm not sure I could add a lot more to that. That's a fabulous summing up. Um, and I think from my side, you know, a couple of points that seem to have come through quite strongly. The one is that this is a really important step forward in terms of the scientific community finally engaging in these ABS questions. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's an important milestone and it's one that we should use to build momentum around. So, so that's great and well done to everybody involved in the report. Um, Secondly, I think this message around sort of the simpler, the simpler, the more effective is really important um, alongside the call for, for really thinking about a cost benefit analysis of access and benefit sharing over the last three decades. And um, sort of the, the, the large amounts of money that have been poured into making a system work versus uh, the benefits that have actually been um, received. And just reflecting, I think, on that quite deeply as we look towards a sort of an ABS DSI linked future. Um, the third, I think, is that the options you've presented are very much, as you say in the report, um, a, a first step and that they, you know, they mix and match. So it's not either or. I think there are quite a few comments saying we don't like any of these. Um, and my guess is that this is a really important start but the options will, will evolve um, as the discussions feed in and as different viewpoints are drawn in. And notice there, there are quite a few gaps and they're not necessarily scientific gaps. I think a lot of them are governance gaps and that wasn't the task of your report, but these are, are important conversations to take forward um, about legal vehicles, um, given that you know, DSI is this mesh and that there are multiple legal instruments dealing with it. You know, how do we think creatively, innovatively um, about legal vehicles to deal with, with the questions that you're raising? Um, who is the scientific community? We, we've touched on that a little bit. How do we enable greater inclusiveness in these conversations so that it's, the global South becomes much more actively involved? Um, and then I think a really important third one is, is around governance. And there were some questions about uh, the public 
private partnerships that have developed over the years and you know some of their failings uh, and some questions around the efficacy of, of those partnerships and I think we need to start having some really good conversations about the kinds of mechanisms that we need that you know, could feasibly work in a transparent way, in an inclusive way, in a participatory manner to, to meet uh, the needs of our world and address equity issues. And to me, we've got a long way uh, ahead of us before we really think of those in, in a creative way rather than uh, sort of enabling these uh, very large funds that tend to give power to those who already have the power. So those would be my closing remarks. And thank you very much to the, the audience for such a fabulous, engaging conversation. I'm hoping that all of these discussions can be distributed in some way back to participants because it's a really great record of uh, some great points raised that we haven't had a chance to, to grapple with.